Hey guys, it's Chris with Highline Guitars. You're watching another one of my YouTube guitar building videos. If you're new to my channel, welcome. I hope that by the end of this video, I'll have earned your subscription. Okay, first of all, you're going to have to excuse the sound of my voice. Uh, I just spent the last week getting over Omicron, so my voice is still a little bit... Uh, uh, not up to standard. <laughs> so anyway, uh, what I want to do today is answer some questions from viewers about guitar building. And I have three questions that I'm going to focus on today. The first is, can you use burl wood for a fretboard? The second is, which is better for tone and sustain? A Gibson style tunematic or a Fender style hardtail. And then the last question is, is there a better way to control neck relief on a guitar that has a zero fret? So let's jump in and get started. With respect to using burl wood as a fretboard, I will say right off the bat, sure, why not? But in truth, I wouldn't do it myself. And the reason is, for a fretboard, the wood has to be very hard and very dense. But most importantly, that hardness and density has to be consistent from one end to the other. And that's because you're going to be cutting slots, very thin slots, that will hold the frets in place. And if the wood is inconsistent in its density and hardness, there's a chance over time that those frets could work their way up out of the fret slots. So to preserve their installation, you really need to have wood that has the right qualities. And burl wood certainly could, but it, it may not. Because burl, uh, well, first of all, let me explain what burl is. When a tree grows, it has tissue that forms the branches. And sometimes those branches won't form properly. They'll get a bud that doesn't completely sprout out of the tree. And then over time, as the tree grows, that area becomes covered in uh, the, the rings and tree grain, which creates kind of a, a, a kind of a bulbous uh, feature on the side of the tree. And when that type of tree is harvested and cut, you'll see inside those burls, it's a swirly pattern of grain. And it can be really attractive, but it can also be really inconsistent. So first of all, the, the base species of tree um, that has the burl needs to have the hardness and density that you would look for in a fretboard. And, you know, we're talking woods like ebony and um, rosewood, maple. Those are the woods that we commonly use for fretboards. Burl isn't a species, it's a condition. And it can happen on just about any species of tree. So you can get maple burl, you can get um, camphor burl, all, all different kinds of uh, different trees that have burl. Some trees are more susceptible than others, but... Um, you can find it pretty much anywhere. And uh, the problem is with burl, it's the same problem that can happen with figured wood, like flamed maple or quilted maple. The density and hardness can vary in the wood. So you might have one section where it's nice and hard and dense and, and will do a great job of holding the frets, but then further up the board, it may not be as hard and dense. So you can run into some issues with being able to hold those frets in consistently down the fretboard. The same might happen with burl wood. Now, I know that in uh, certain situations, burl wood can actually be placed into a vacuum chamber with acrylic and then stabilized. And what you get out of that is a consistent hardness and density, which might work really well for a fretboard. I've never used it myself, but if I was going to, that's probably the route that I would go. However, that type of wood for a fretboard, I'm not sure how easy it is to source something like that. So the uh, short answer is yes, you can use burl, but you need to make sure that it's going to be consistent in its hardness and uh, density throughout its length, either naturally or through artificial means. Okay, so the next question is, 
which is better for tone and sustain, a tunematic like a get like Gibson guitars use or a Fender style hardtail bridge? The simple answer is they're both good. They're both equal in their capabilities. What it comes down to is execution. I've seen guitars that had two pneumatic bridges that had amazing tone and sustain because of how well the bridge was installed as well as the quality of the bridge itself. The uh, Fender Hardtails, it's the same thing. I've seen them that have just incredible tone and sustain, but at the same time with both bridges I've seen poorly executed. Uh, and what happens typically is it's, it's either a poor quality bridge itself, and there's a lot of tunematics and hardtail fender style bridges out there that are just terrible. They're, they're uh, pop metal junk, and those bridges, you can almost be guaranteed to have poor uh, tone and sustain because they just don't have the hardness and the density that the bridge material needs to have in order to achieve good tone and sustain. And then of course it comes down to how well they're installed into the body of the guitar and um, what's known as coupling, which is the uh, transfer of the strings vibration to the bridge and uh, its ability to hold the frequencies in the string rather than letting it bleed off into nothing. So, you know, that gets kind of technical and I don't want to get uh, too deep into that. But um, I, you'll never hear me saying that one style of bridge is better than the other because it, it just comes down to the quality of the bridge and how well uh, the installation was executed. So now an easier question to answer is which one is easier to install? And in fact, the, the, the type of bridge you use is going to dictate not only the difficulty of installation, but the entire design of your guitar. With a tunematic bridge, the bridge has to be installed at a slightly, uh, at a slight angle with the bridge or the base side of the, of the bridge further back than the treble side from the nut. And that is done to allow for proper intonation of the bass strings. Those strings, uh, typically the, the scale length is longer, so you have to move the saddle further back. And unfortunately, two pneumatic bridges, when they were first designed, didn't take into account how much that saddle would have to be moved back in order to intonate the bass strings. So the bridges weren't wide enough. They were you know, kept fairly narrow. As a result, um, it was discovered that the only way to get the strings to, to intonate properly, the bass strings, was to angle it so that the bass side is, is further from the face of the nut thereby lengthening the scale. Uh, you also, because of the height of a tunematic bridge, you have to angle your neck down towards the tuners. Otherwise, if you try to keep the neck flat, you have to raise the neck so high out of the body, it becomes awkward. So to keep the, the fretboard lower to the body, you have to angle it in order to bring the strings down to get proper string height action over the frets. That adds complexity to constructing the guitar. With a hardtail bridge, you can leave the neck level. And one of the nice features of the hardtail, the Fender style hardtail bridge, is that each saddle is not only individually adjustable for intonation, but you can adjust the height individually and really dial in the radius of your strings over the frets. It's a little bit more difficult to do that with a tunematic because the saddles are, are fixed in terms of their height. The only way that you can adjust it is to deepen the slot in the saddle that the string fits in. And that just adds to the complexity of installing a tunematic on a guitar. So just keep that in mind. Now for the last question, I have to demonstrate using an acoustic guitar because it's the only guitar that I currently have in my shop that has a zero fret on it. And a viewer wanted to know, is it better to control neck relief by angling the neck or adjusting the truss rod when the guitar has a zero fret? And that's an interesting question because it involves the hypothetical, 
where you can actually dial in to perfection the guitar's neck angle during construction. So if you could do that, then you wouldn't need to adjust the relief with the truss rod. But that in itself kind of reveals why it doesn't necessarily work because even with a CNC machine, which is able to achieve a very high degree of precision, getting that neck at precisely the angle that you need to achieve the relief you want on a guitar with a zero fret is extremely difficult to accomplish. In fact, that's true with pretty much any type of guitar, whether it has a zero fret or not. But uh, just as a quick explanation, a zero fret is a system where the, the start of your scale length is on a fret itself called the zero fret instead of the face of the nut. There is a nut, but all it does is control the string spacing. The actual scale length starts at the zero fret because each string rests on top of that fret. Now with the zero fret, uh, it is actually the same size fret as your other frets, but because the strings gradually rise up above higher and higher off the fretboard towards the bridge, you have a tiny amount of space between the bottom of the strings and the top of the first fret. So what the, the viewer wanted to know is, is it better to control relief by angling the neck than it is to use a truss rod? Well, if you precisely engineer your guitar to uh, allow the neck to be installed at a very specific angle, that might be possible. But that rarely happens when we make a guitar. All it takes is to move the nut end of the neck up or down by as little as a 64th of an inch or even less than that, and it can dramatically affect the relief and the string action over the upper frets. It doesn't take much to do that. So if you're not careful, trying to rely on using angle of the neck to control the relief between the strings and the frets is incredibly unpredictable. That's one of the reasons why we have a truss rod to begin with, because the truss rod, by making very tiny adjustments, we can get very precise uh, degree of relief and it's much easier to do. So the uh, short answer to that question is, no, you really shouldn't do it that way. I would use the truss rod to always control the amount of neck relief, whether it's got a zero fret or not. So at any rate, I hope that you've enjoyed this video. Um, and if so, give it a thumbs up. If you're new to the channel, welcome. I hope you'll consider subscribing. And if you would like to help support the channel, uh, hit my eGuitar Plans website. You can purchase plans for tools and guitars and all sorts of things. Or you can go down to the merch shelf down below this description for this video and not only purchase those same uh, plans, but you can also get t-shirts and stuff like that. So until the next episode, as always, take care, stay safe, and I hope you'll be back for the next episode.